This Sunday, the coronavirus surge. We find ourselves careening toward a catastrophic and unsustainable situation. Half the states seeing a steep rise in infections. The time for prevention measures was a month ago. Now, it, I mean, the wheels are coming off. We might feel like we're done with COVID-19, uh, but COVID-19 isn't done with us. States slowing reopenings as younger Americans drive the surge. Are you concerned about coronavirus, really? Not, not, not anymore, I'm really not. Vice President Pence spins the administration's record. We have uh, made a truly remarkable progress. We slowed the spread, we flattened the curve, we saved lives. While Anthony Fauci offers a warning to the young. If you get infected, you will infect someone else who clearly will infect someone else. My guest this morning, Health and Human Services Secretary Alex Azar and New York Governor Andrew Cuomo. Plus, John Bolton speaks out about President Trump. There really isn't any guiding principle that I was able to discern other than what's good for Donald Trump's re-election. It's a close race to see who could see through him the clearest and, uh, and tried to manipulate him. And the president strikes back. Everyone thought he was crazy. Because all he wants to do is bomb people. This morning, my one-on-one -on -one with John Bolton. I believe America can recover from one term of Donald Trump. I, I believe that very, very strongly. I'm more worried about a second term. Also, Mississippi lawmakers take steps to remove the Confederate battle emblem from their state flag, the last of the southern states to do so. Joining me for Insight and Analysis are Eddie Glaude Jr. of Princeton University, NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Casey Hunt, and Hugh Hewitt, host on the Salem Radio Network. Welcome to Sunday. It's Meet the Press. From NBC News in Washington, the longest running show in television history, this is Meet the Press with Chuck Todd. Good Sunday morning. Throughout his presidency, there have been countless this is it moments that opponents of President Trump felt sure would puncture his standing with voters. Charlottesville, immigrant children in cages, impeachment, just to name three. But nothing seemed to move Mr. Trump's approval ratings much one way or the other. Now, however, the president is facing a crisis he has been unable to tweet, bluster, or bluff his way out of. COVID-19 and the death toll and economic dislocation that come with it is there for all of us to see. Every American is aware of it. Every American is affected by it. Every American has an opinion about it. The past week felt more like April with states and then the whole country setting records for new cases. Cities shutting down and renewed fears that hospitals would soon run out of ICU beds. Through it all, President Trump has been in denial, and the United States has become the object of avoidance, ridicule, and even pity around the world. At home, COVID has given Republicans a permission slip to criticize or ignore the president and provided space for former administration officials like John Bolton, whom I'll interview in a moment, to criticize a president of their own party. Ultimately, as the number of cases goes up, Mr. Trump's political standing goes down, making him now the most endangered incumbent since George H.W. Bush lost in 1992. We find ourselves careening toward a catastrophic and unsustainable situation. Texas and Florida, praised by President Trump for being among the first to reopen, are now backtracking, abruptly setting new restrictions on bars, restaurants, and beaches. There was widespread noncompliance and that led to, led to issues. If you do need to get out, please wear a mask. On Friday, the U.S. set a record for new cases. In 25 states, cases have increased by 25% or more over the last two weeks. In nine states, cases are up more than 100%. The time for prevention measures was a month ago. Now, it, I mean, the wheels are coming off. But on Friday, at the first coronavirus task force briefing in two months, the vice president appeared to deny that reality. We have uh, made a truly remarkable progress in moving our nation forward. The nation's top infectious disease expert, Dr. Fauci, says current efforts to test sick people, isolate them, and trace their contacts are not working. If we don't extinguish the outbreak, sooner or later, even ones that are doing well are going to be vulnerable to the spread. For months, the president has minimized the virus. We have it totally under control. It's one person coming in from China. Looks like by April, you know, in theory, when it gets a little warmer, it miraculously goes away. That this is going to be gone. It's going to go. It's going to leave. It's going to be gone. This is going to go away without a vaccine. Six months into this pandemic in the United States, that message largely dismissing the virus 
hasn't changed. And we're doing so well after the plague. It's going away. This is a localized situation. We slowed the spread. We flattened the curve. We saved lives. But the curve hasn't been flattened. The virus isn't going away, and the issues that plagued early testing efforts remain. So I said to my people, slow the testing down, please. But did you possible. ask to slow it down? Uh, if it did slow down, frankly, I think we're way ahead of ourselves, if you want to know the truth. We've done too good a job, because every time we go up with 25 million tests, you're going to find more people. Some Republicans would like to see like President Trump much. stop politicizing honestly, mask wearing. I I Until we find a vaccine, these are really important. This is not as complicated as a ventilator. And joining me now is the Secretary of Health and Human Services, Alex Adar, uh, Secretary Azar. Welcome to Meet the Press. And let me start with just a simple first question. Why are we failing uh, in the fight against COVID-19 when so much of the rest of the world seems to be succeeding right now? Well, Chuck, let's talk about what we know, which is that we're seeing surging in cases in counties, especially in, south in the southern parts of the United States. Um, we've gotten reports from our governors that the majority of the positive cases we're seeing are age 35 and under. A large number of those are going to be asymptomatic. Uh, we've got our fatality rates and our hospitalization rates are the lowest they've been in two months. But this is a very serious situation. What are we doing about it? We're surging in working with our local authorities and states. This is a county by county issue. So getting in there and getting to the bottom of why we're seeing cases surging. And then in addition to the traditional contact tracing, what we're doing now is we've got to test entire communities, find all positive cases, because this is a very different virus with this asymptomatic spreading. Mm -hmm get every positive case, get those people isolated. We've got hospital capacity in all of these areas. We have personal protective equipment and we're gonna be there to back them up. We now have treatments. We've got steroids, remdesivir, convalescent plasma. And I encourage your listeners, if you've had COVID, call your blood bank, American Red Cross, and please donate plasma to increase our supplies. So we've got the tools to do this. We just did this in the last couple of weeks in North Carolina, but the window is closing. We have to act and people as individuals have to act responsibly. We need to social distance. We need to wear fi our face coverings if we're in settings where we can't social distance, particularly in these hot zones. Well, let me ask you this. Did we blow it during the, the, the first shutdown? The first shutdown was designed, I thought, to do three things. Uh, get our testing capacity up, uh, provide some relief for hospitals, and get make sure we have hospitalization capacity up. And one of the big things was contact tracing. And so it, it seems pretty obvious what happened here. If you just just looking back at a layman, you guys put out guidelines in April about what it would take for a state to open up. No state followed those guidelines under uh, at all Mo some states followed followed them okay pretty closely or came to close but a lot of the states in the south didn't do it at all and a bunch of them don't have contact tracers isn't that why we're here so chuck this isn't about reopening or not reopening we've got many communities and states that are just as reopened as these southern states but aren't experiencing this we've got to get to the bottom of why we're seeing these cases surge in this area but at its core we all own as individuals our individual behavior to make sure that we are practicing appropriate social distancing and wearing facial covering when we're not able to and practicing per good personal hygiene and especially protecting our most vulnerable citizens but you know Dr. Burks and Dr. Fauci talked about this at our press briefing on Friday, that one of the bedeviling things about this virus is the asymptomatic spread of it, which means the right. traditional contact tracing of public health that our local authorities are so used to is a necessary but not sufficient protection. We've got to yeah. do that, but it can't just be sitting in a public health office making phone calls. We've got to get into the community. We've got to get dust on the boots. We've got right. to find the people and test entire communities to get our positive cases. That's the type of action we've seen in North Carolina, and that's what we need in these other local communities. But Mr. Secretary, I still don't understand why we don't have uh, enough contact tracers. Uh, this, uh, the head of the CDC said we have less than 100,000 nationwide. We, we, we should have 300,000, some experts have thought. And, and again, we've been at this five months now. Why don't we have enough physical contact tracers in these southern states? Well, Chuck, these, these states have to build up their contact tracers, but they've also just got to build up getting into the states, getting out into these counties, into these local communities. It's a very community-based effort at this point. So we've surged people into every one of these states. 
We're working with them on the ground, but it's about getting out, working with NGOs, working with community, trusted community leaders, getting testing done, getting people isolated. But it's important to remember, we now have many more tools than we had months ago to deal with this. We have therapeutics. Right. We're on the road to vaccines. We have personal protective equipment. And again, I'd say any hospital, nursing home that needs anything, be sure your governor's office knows we'll get that into FEMA and we'll make sure we're there to support you. Uh, I asked the governor of Arkansas, Republican Asa Hutchinson, um, if, it would, if his job would be made easier to get his community, get his state to wear masks, if the president, he doesn't have to wear one, if he would just say it, just tweet it. Here was his response to me, sir. A consistent national message supporting the importance of wearing a mask and social distancing is very important to making sure everybody understands the importance of it. Nothing beats leadership. Mr. Secretary, multiple times with me in our seven minutes so far that we've talked, you've brought up masks, you've brought up social distancing. But without the president of the United States doing this, I, I, how's half the country going to listen? Have you directly asked the president to please ask the country to wear a mask? So I'm the president's secretary of health. I'm telling you practice social distancing where you can't appropriately social distance we encourage you to wear a facial covering the vice president of the united states on friday stood on stage walked up on stage wearing a mask even though he doesn't need to in the sense that everybody around him is tested he's in a bubble the president we know is a very unique circumstance as leader of the free world he's tested constantly and those around him are tested constantly and are kept at a distance even with that but we're all saying this the president's guidelines for reopening the president's guidelines his guidelines have said from day one practice social distancing if you can't wear face coverings practice appropriate personal hygiene and always please consider your individual circumstances and those of your household members. Protect the most vulnerable, those over 80, those over 65 with three or more of the serious comorbid conditions. These are the people we have to ring fence and protect right now. It's a do, but what you just articulated, Mr. Secretary, is a do as I say, not as I do. The President of the United States holding indoor rallies twice in the last 10 days, once in a state that is seeing um, a, a potential of an out of control spread in Arizona. He doesn't talk about wearing a mask. And you avoided my question about whether you've asked the president to at least ask the country to wear a mask. Just because you put guidelines under his name, when he doesn't do it, his people don't listen. Well, Chuck, I'm not going to talk about politics, but we've seen mass gatherings over the last several weeks where, with people rightly expressing First Amendment uh, and political views, and this is appropriate. But um, my message is one of public health, which is if you're going to participate in any type of large gathering, I encourage you, consider your individual circumstance, consider the, your, the circumstance of those you live with, and take appropriate precautions that are appropriate to yourself and your community. Secretary Azar, I have to leave it there. Um, appreciate you coming on and sharing the administration's perspective. Thank you, Chuck. During the first peak of the COVID crisis, Andrew Cuomo was one of the faces of the response, giving daily televised press briefings as New York became the epicenter of the pandemic in the United States. Now, cases and deaths are way down in New York. And instead of New Yorkers being quarantined when they travel to states like Florida, it's New York that is doing the quarantining of out-of-state visitors from places like Florida. And joining me now is the governor of New York, Andrew Cuomo. Governor, I want to start with what we just heard from Secretary Azar, uh, and that is sort of, it, it seems as if he believes this is on the states, that our contact tracing problem in the South is on the states. Uh, was this second surge, in your opinion, preventable? Yeah, uh, good to be with you, Chuck. Uh, first, I don't think this is a second surge. Uh, we're worried about a second wave. I think we're still in the first wave, and this is uh, a continuation of the first wave, and it was a failed effort to stop the first wave in the country. Uh, and as you pointed out, New York is uh, in a totally different place. Uh, look, if you listen to what the secretary said, if you listen to what the president says, what they said at the White House briefing, they're saying what they said three months ago. Uh, they're basically in denial about the problem. They don't want to tell the American people the truth. Uh, and they don't want to have any federal uh, response except supporting the right. state, supporting the state. So I heard that and I understood where they were. Uh, I was I didn't need to torture the rhetoric. 
I knew what they were saying. You're on your own. <laughs> you know? And right. it's not a good feeling, but it's sort of liberating. So in New York, we just handled it totally differently, Chuck. We handled it on our own. Communication, clear, as you mentioned, every day. <clears throat> and then we came up with a plan and did the testing and did the isolation. And that makes a difference. <clears throat> You followed the this, this set of guidelines I pointed out. I remember this distinctly. Only one time did we hear the White House ever talk about the gate, the infamous gating criteria. And then I think that phrase disappeared. You created sort of you use that guidance. You guys created your own. But in all honesty, how hard is it going to be to stop a, another resurgence in your state if the rest of the country is struggling the way it's struggling? Well, that's our problem. Look, the CDC guidelines, first of all, were just guidelines. They were very uh, vague. I don't even know what they meant. The uh, trajectory has to be coming down. We put in place our own metrics uh, where we, we used science. Uh, and we wouldn't open any region unless they hit certain metrics. And then we have a phased reopening that we're in the midst of. But you look at the number of hospital beds who actually have the testing up. We do more testing than any state in the United States, Chuck. We do more testing per capita than any country on the globe. The testing is the key. You do the isolation, uh, you have enough PPE, enough ICU beds, uh, and then you, you, from the testing, you have a rate of transmission that you can monitor and you proceed through the phases if you hit that rate of transmission. This is a virus. It doesn't respond to politics. Uh, you can't tweet at it. You have to treat it. And we never did that. Now my fear is we had today five deaths. Uh, now we, we uh, offer thoughts and prayers to every death in our state, but five deaths is the lowest number we have had since this started, right. Chuck. We are on the exact opposite end. We have uh, less than 800 people uh, in hospitals. Lowest number basically since we started. How does that number go up? Two ways. Lack of compliance, uh, and I'm diligent about staying after New Yorkers and local governments that have right. to police it. And second, I'm now afraid of the spread coming from other states because we are one country and people travel, and I'm afraid the infection rate in the other states will come back to New York and raise that rate again. All right, if Governor DeSantis calls you up, this afternoon, Governor Abbott calls you up this afternoon of Texas and Florida and they say, all right, let's set the politics aside. I know, you know, we mouthed off at, at you a little bit. What's your recommendation? How it, uh, what should we do here? What would you tell them? I'll tell you. I'll tell you. Uh, I, I don't wait for them to call. This is New York. We're proactive. Uh, my <laughs> team has called their teams and said, look, can we help? Uh, when we were in trouble, Chuck, we had states all across the nation who came to help us. We had 30,000 volunteers from across right. the United States who came to help us. Uh, so I called those states. I said, any way we can help. Uh, we've gone through it. We have the equipment. We have the staff. We have the testing protocols. We have the testing software. We have the tracing program. Uh, can we help? Anything you need, ventilators, et cetera. And that's the right thing to do from a community point of view and a citizenry point of view. It's also, uh, there's a parochial interest, which is if these states keep going up, we're going to have a national right. crisis like we have never seen. Uh, they said this was the way to help the economy by reopening. It's been the exact opposite. Every time the virus goes up, the stock market goes down. Uh, and if those, if those states continue to increase, you'll see it go all across the nation. You'll see New York on the rise again and you'll see the other states starting to go up even more. Has this, I, you have not released a school opening plan. I know you have some recommendations out, but I'm curious now, because this is my fear, is that this new, this new surge or spike that we're seeing in the South is now gonna delay every school district's plans for creating, maybe it's a dual, a hybrid system of some in-person, some remote universities. Are you now thinking that maybe we might not see everything goes remote now in the fall, given we're living with this virus until there's a vaccine? Well, uh, first on the first your first point. Yes, I agree with that. 
Uh, you know, everybody talked about the uh, economic consequence, and every, the president said we should reopen, and that's going to help the economy. It turned out to be exactly wrong. But there's also a social uh, consequence. Children have missed schools. Children have missed the interaction with other children. That's part of the socialization process. Uh, we're preparing to open schools. We have plans to open schools. But look, uh, Chuck, I'll be honest with you, it's two months away. Uh, anything can happen in two months. You look back two months and you see how many things have changed. I want to see what the infection rate is and what the disease is doing uh, before we pull the trigger and make the decision. We, we're looking at this Kawasaki-like syndrome uh, that now in, uh, uh, is an inflammatory syndrome that affects children who were previously right. infected with COVID. I mean, this is complicated. Right. So let's get the facts and we'll make the decision when we have to. But we're prepared. Yeah. But if this continues across the country, you're right, Chuck. Kids are going to be home for a long time. Um, and final question. We talked about this, uh, about nursing homes before. Um, and, and you've taken some heat on the directive and you've said you were following a national directive. But let's let me ask it again. Similarly, at this point, do you think these senior centers are safe? period. Yeah. Uh, look, there's, uh, I've taken political heat, okay? There are facts in this politics. Uh, there's no doubt in nursing homes all across this nation, that's where we saw most of the deaths. Not most, but almost 50% of the deaths. Senior citizens in congregate right. settings. Uh, and uh, it's, it's becoming more and more clear that the infection in the nursing homes came from the staff that got infected and brought it in. Uh, but in New York, we're number 46 in the nation in terms of percentage of deaths at nursing homes compared to the total percentage. By the New York Times, we're number 46. So uh, it's been unfortunate in every state. We have to do more. We have to figure it out. But if they want to point fingers, uh, not at New York, we're number 46. You have uh, 45 other states to point fingers at first. I understand that. Are these safe? Are these facilities safe in your mind right now? They are as safe. They are as safe. Well, in this state, well, we're testing every week, every uh, nursing home employee. Right. Right. Uh, so you could argue that they are safer than a senior citizen at home who is receiving care at home. The safest environment. Okay. My mother stay home. Don't see anyone. If you are uh, at right. home and you have an aide coming in, that aide is not tested. In a nursing home, the staff is being tested once a week, and uh, seniors right. do have to be careful wherever they are. Governor Cuomo, I'd love to keep going, but I am out of time. I appreciate you coming on, sharing your perspective with us, and uh, sure. stay safe out there. Thanks, you too. When we come back, my interview with President Trump's former national security advisor, John Bolton. Welcome back. It's been only five days since John Bolton's book, The Room Where It Happened, hit bookstores. In that time, President Trump has called his former national security advisor a fool, crazy, and someone who just wanted to drop bombs on everyone. Bolton has dropped some verbal bombs of his own, saying Mr. Trump is easily duped by our adversaries, is unfit for office, and has used his power as president for personal gain. Well, joining me now is the author of said book, John Bolton. Ambassador Bolton, welcome back to Meet the Press, sir. Thanks for having me. Well, before we get to the substance of your book, I want to get to what we've just learned over the last 48 hours. There's some reporting this weekend that an arm, um, reported by the New York Times, that an arm of, of Russian military intelligence has secretly been paying bounties to Taliban-linked militias to kill American and other coalition forces in Afghanistan. There's a lot we don't know. The U.S. government has not confirmed or denied the intelligence report. They have only simply denied that the president was informed in March of this. I'm just curious of your initial reaction to this report, Ambassador. Well, it's, uh, as you say, there's a lot we don't know, so we should be cautious. But from what we do know from the president's own tweets this morning, uh, to me, it looks like uh, just another day at the office in the Trump White House. Uh, I've never uh, uh, recalled a circumstance where the president himself goes out of his way to say he wasn't briefed on something. Uh, we may be in the, uh, you know, what the definition of is is here. What, when you say brief, mm -hmm. does that mean he's never been told of anything about it? Uh, we don't know the quality of the intelligence uh, uh, or the extent of it. If it does go back to March, uh, that raises other questions. And, and the key point is, if 
uh, there's any accuracy to it. If the Russians have actually been paying to see Americans killed, that is a very, very serious matter. I, I'm just curious uh, it, if there was an intelligence assessment like this, can you imagine a scenario where it is withheld from the president? I mean, that part of this just seems extraordinarily hard to believe. Is it not for you? Well, again, it depends on what the level of confidence in the intelligence is. Uh, I tried uh, during my tenure at the White House to read as much intelligence as I could. Th that doesn't mean I passed all of it on to, uh, to Trump or, or to others. I think it's just important to understand there needs to be a filter for any president, maybe particularly for this president. So there's obviously more to this story, but it, but it is pretty remarkable the president's going out of his way to say he hasn't heard anything about it. One, one asks, why would he do something like that? And I think the answer may be uh, precisely because uh, an active Russian aggression like that against uh, the American service members is, is a very, very serious matter. And nothing's been done about it, if it's true, for these past four or five months. So it may look like he was negligent, but of course he can disown everything if nobody ever told him about it. Let me ask you this. Do you, do you think that part of the, that the president is afraid to make Putin mad because Maybe Putin did help him win the election and he doesn't want to make him mad for 2020? Uh, honestly, I don't think there's evidence for that. And, and I think it's a mistake uh, on the one hand to say uh, the Russia collusion theory was true, uh, which some uh, opponents of Trump still can't let I'm go of. I'm not saying of, collusion. Uh, versus but Ambassador, Trump I'm not himself. saying collusion. Hang, hang on, on hang on. Yeah. Ha okay. Hang on, hang on, hang on versus the Donald Trump approach, which is the Russians didn't do anything at all in the election. I think it's clear from all the data, and it's been discussed publicly, of course the Russians tried to interfere in the 2016 election, and they're going to try and do it again this year, as will the Chinese and maybe the Iranians and the North Koreans. Uh, that's why uh, during the Trump administration, whether the president was fully cognizant of it or not, uh, the agencies and departments charged with trying to prevent yeah. that worked very hard to increase our defenses. So why is the president so defensive about Putin? Uh, I don't, I, as I say, I don't read anything into it necessarily. I, if I had evidence, I, I would reveal it. I just don't know what to, to say other than he, he likes dealing with strong authoritarian figures. You've made it clear that you think the president's unfit for office. Do you think a second term of Donald Trump is an existential threat to the country? I'm very worried about it. Look, I, I think damage has been done in the first term. I, I lay it out uh, in, in the book as I see it. But I, I, I believe America can recover from one term of Donald Trump. I, I believe that very, very strongly. I'm more worried about a second term. And it's not just decisions in the national security space. I'm worried about uh, the corruption of the civil discourse in this country. Uh, by a president who says the sorts of things that you quoted at the uh, outset of uh, of our discussion, uh, I think it I think it degrades the body politic. There are plenty of other people doing the same thing. Don't get me wrong, but I just think it's unpresidential right. to behave that way, and that will have serious consequences. Let me ask you about uh, briefly about your the impeachment uh, and your decision not to testify this week. The the New Yorker profiled Fiona Hill, who was the National Security Council's Russia director during most of your tenure who did testify during the House impeachment investigation. And there was this anecdote in there, uh, Ambassador. After Hill's testimony, Bolton asked Sarah Tinsley, a longtime aide, to relay a personal message. You did the right thing. If it was the right thing for Fiona Hill, sir, why wasn't it the right thing for you? Because I was in a very different circumstance. You know, my deputy, Charlie Kupperman, was subpoenaed by the House. He was directed by the White House not to testify. He went to court. You know, you got the one branch, the legislative branch, saying do one thing, the executive branch saying another. He went to the judicial branch to get an answer. And the House of Representatives withdrew their subpoena. Look, I've written in the book, uh, I think, the House advocates of impeachment uh, committed impeachment malpractice. I think they played right into Donald Trump's strategy uh, and, uh, and, and, and lost a real opportunity by creating a partisan issue when they might have gotten some Republicans who could have helped out. And by the end of the process, uh, I think everybody, including on the Republican side, believed that there was a quid pro quo in Ukraine. But the House effort 
uh, didn't take into account the possibility that the White House would argue successfully that even if it were true, it didn't rise to the level of an impeachable offense. Mm -hmm. I think there was another way to do this. We saw it in Watergate where there was bipartisan cooperation. Uh, you know, if I, were, uh, if, if I were one of those who had advocated impeachment in the House, I, I'd be looking for other people to blame at the moment, too. Um, final question is, you, you, you've made a case that a second term of Donald Trump will be really damaging. You have said, though, that you cannot support a Joe Biden candidacy. What is worse, to, in your mind, a second Trump term or a first term of Joe Biden? You know, it's, it's a comparison of apples and oranges. I'm very unhappy, and I don't think I'm untypical of a lot of conservative Republicans. Uh, who really wish there was a conservative Republican on the ballot. Some, some will vote for Joe Biden. I respect that. Uh, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to write in the name of a conservative Republican. I think others will, will probably just not vote at the presidential level at all. Uh, it's not an easy choice. It's not a happy choice. Uh, and, and I wish there were an alternative. Uh, may, maybe one will come. I don't see it. Uh, but that's where we are at the moment. And you have said that you really want to focus on helping Republicans keep the Senate George Will, who I know you're very familiar with, has argued that Senate Republicans have enabled Donald Trump too much and they are part of the problem. What do you say to his critique? Well, I have enormous respect for George Will uh, and have over the years. Uh, look, there, the, the, this is part of, uh, I think, the, the damage to the political system that Donald Trump has done, that, it, it, that everything has been torqued around Donald Trump personally. I think politics is about philosophy. Uh, and that's why I think ultimately it is critical for the republic that Republicans keep the majority in the Senate, whether Trump wins or loses. Ambassador Bolton, I, I have to leave it there. Uh, I appreciate you coming on, sharing your perspective. Uh, your book has made quite the splash, and I have a feeling uh, it may linger for some time. So good luck out there. Well, thanks very much. When we come back, the polling, all the polling has gotten much worse for President Trump. Is he able to change the direction of this race? Panelists next. Welcome back. Panel is with us from their remote locations. Eddie Glaude Jr., Princeton University and author of the new book, James Baldwin's America and its urgent lessons for our own. NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Casey Hunt and Hugh Hewitt, host on the Salem Radio Network. Well, I want to begin with... Um, an answer that has made the rounds in the political world, and it was an answer the president gave to a simple question Sean Hannity asked him, which is, what's your agenda for a second term? Here it is, Hugh Hewitt. What are your top priority items for a second term? Well, one of the things that will be really great, you know, the word experience is still good. I always say talent is more important than experience. I've always said that. But the word experience is a very important word. It's in a very important meaning. I never did this before. I never slept over in Washington. I was in Washington, I think, 17 times. All of a sudden, I'm president of the United States. You know the story. I'm riding down Pennsylvania Avenue with our first lady, and I say, this is great. But I didn't know very many people in Washington. It wasn't my thing. I was from Manhattan, from New York. Now I know everybody. And I have great people in the administration. You make some mistakes, like, you know, an idiot like Bolton. All he wanted to do is drop bombs on everybody. Hugh Hewitt, was that Roger Mudd, Ted Kennedy, uh, Redux? No, that was a Clayton Kershaw windup, and I think the president did not throw the pitch, which is we're going to get back to 3.5 percent unemployment in January. We're going to get to a 355 ship navy. I've got two Supreme Court justices, uh, 53 appeals court judges, 143 district court judges. We're going to have the economic blue collar boom back. I mean, you've got to deliver on the pitch. But no, I didn't think it was a yeah. Roger Mudd moment at all. Casey Hunt, we have started this week for the first time public on the record criticism of the president's political messaging. John Thune, probably the most prominent. Uh, is this the beginning of a crack, at least in a rhetorical split between Senate Republicans and the White House? Well, Chuck, we've asked ourselves that over and over and over again, and it never has been. But on the other hand, the president previously was winning. He had Republican support behind him, and the theory was that the Republican base 
was going to get them going to get them across the finish line and, and therefore bring Senate Republicans along. And this pandemic, I think, has really shattered that theory of the case, as we have seen this president's numbers sink in a substantial way. And I don't think you can disconnect that from the rhetoric that we're hearing from Senate Republicans. As you pointed out, this isn't a situation where the only Americans who are following politics are the ones who are the most invested, the most partisan. The coronavirus has affected and touched every single American household. The numbers of Americans who know someone who has died from coronavirus are terribly high. They're, and, and they're much higher among households of color who are also newly reengaged in the wake of George Floyd's death. And if you are someone who is relying on the president's coattails to get you across the finish line in November, this is a very, very difficult place to be. Now, I think the sense is going to be, especially for you know many voters who have been turn, tuned into this all the way along, that it is far too little too late for these Republicans to break with the president at this stage, Chuck. Mm -hmm. Right. Eddie, uh, why do you believe the, it's been the virus that has produced the first cracks in that floor of support? I mean, one of the things we've noticed is for the first time, instead of, you know, sitting at that 44, 45 mark stubbornly, right, no matter what happened, this is the first time you're starting to see, and it's slow, but you're starting to see cracks, and he went down a couple of floors. He's more mm -hmm. like in the 40, 41 age. Why the virus? How did the virus make this happen while none of those other stories did? Well, in some ways, Chuck, the virus isn't partisan. It doesn't care about politics, uh, to my mind. And what it has done, in some ways, it has created a kind of continuity, a kind of similarity across our differences. We're all vulnerable. Some are more vulnerable than others, but we're all vulnerable to this. We're all having to deal with the fact that some of us have lost loved ones and we can't send them home. We can't, we can't attend their funerals. We can't uh, celebrate their lives like we wanted to, uh, like we would ordinarily to do. Uh, so I think at the end of the day, uh, I think everyday ordinary people talking around the country want a response from the federal government to a pandemic that has disrupted everything in our lives. And I think the administration has failed. And it's failed not only Democrats, it's failed Republicans, independents, it's failed all of Americans. Hugh, how would you advise the president to turn this around? I mean, it, it does look like at this point they've made the decision the federal government isn't going to own the response. I mean, Secretary Azar kept bringing it back to the states, back to the states. Uh, I understand that's a, 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 a federalism response, but it's not working. Well, yesterday, 500 Americans died, Chuck, and in Germany, 680 Germans died. Uh, the United States' death toll has dropped dramatically from May when it was 2,700. And in between, it's been a month and three days since George Floyd was murdered. In between, we had millions of Americans express their anger at over... Uh, zealous policing and at the unnecessary use of violence, often lethal against African-Americans. And that was an event in the story of this virus. There's mm -hmm. another event in the story of the virus. There's a ventilator supply now of 50,000 that the president got done. There is a, a, a lot more social distancing and a lot of older Americans are intuitively staying away. And the sharp rise in right. cases is among younger Americans. So what I think the president has to do, I, look, Joe Biden is very confident. He's measuring the, dapes, uh, the drapes in the uh, White House basement already. He's going to, he thinks he's got this in the bag. President needs to, as I said in the first segment, go back to his numbers and say, hey, America, who's going to get us back to where we were in January? Joe Biden in the basement or Donald Trump? And I think he's got to do that in one-on-one -on -one interviews with as many people, including you and people who might be very tough on him in, in conversation every day, a one-on-one -on -one interview right. like he did in 2016. Okay. Casey, do Senate Republicans want the federal government to take more responsibility for this response? Yes. Yes, absolutely yes. I mean, this has been an unmitigated disaster for the perspective of many of them. And I'm sorry, but this picture that Hugh is painting of, you know, Americans looking at you know, the world the way it was in January and definitely deciding here in June that President Trump is the one to fix the problems that that frankly cascaded on his watch seems to me to be something certainly that when I talk to Senate Republicans behind closed doors, they don't buy. 
All right, I'm going to pause the conversation here, but I promise everybody's got another shot at this uh, uh, in a moment. When we come back, just how far behind the world is the United States in combating the coronavirus? That's next. Welcome back, data download time. Let's take a look at how the United States is doing compared with other countries in controlling the coronavirus. At 107 cases per 1 million people, the United States has one of the highest infection rates in the world. Brazil's is higher, with a seven-day average of about 163 new infections per 1 million. Russia and India are also in double digits per 1 million people, and of course, we can't be sure how accurate the reporting is in all cases. At the other end of the data, Germany and Italy have made large strides in containing the virus. Both were above 60 new infections per million people at one point and are now in the single digits. And as we pass the six month mark of the virus in these countries, the date of first infection does not seem to be playing into infection rates either. The United States had its earliest recorded COVID-19 case back on January 21st, with all of the other countries except Brazil following just a week or so later. And it should be noted, the United States is not only the wealthiest nation, we also have the highest health care spending of any of these nations. President Trump argues the numbers are only rising because the United States is testing more. But the data suggests that other factors are driving this increase. For instance, the United States' positive test rate is six percentage points. That is higher than all of the other countries except India. Compared with Germany at 0.9% and Italy, where the percentage of positive cases is much lower, lower than 1% actually, one thing of the struggling countries that all of them have in common is leaders like President Trump and Jair Bolsonaro in Brazil who have played down the threat of the virus. Of course, no one leader is entirely responsible for infection rates, but as the pandemic continues, the politics and the data seem to carry a warning that the voices at the top matter, and they may matter a lot. When we come back, the growing debate over taking down monuments. Welcome back. Panel is back. And Casey Hunt, I I'm gonna start by uh, giving a little hat tip to the first read team. We put together sort of, we're here at the halfway mark of this calendar year, and these are the notable, important news events of the first six months of this year, and it's a, it starts with the killing of Soleimani. Uh, I'm sure many Americans, many viewers probably forgot that was the beginning of this year. Remember the Iowa caucuses um, broke down. We didn't know who the winner there was for a while. There was a point Joe Biden was in fifth place. We could go on and on and on, and of course, at some point, the virus becomes a dominant feature of this timeline. But Casey Hunt, in going through this exercise, when I hear people say, oh, geez, there's still a long time to go, I look at this list and think, boy, a lot of things have happened and nothing has changed the trajectory of this for Donald Trump. Chuck, I do think that while on the one hand, it's easy to look at that list and think, man, what are we going to add to it between now and November? There are right. many possibilities that I think a lot of us don't even want to contemplate. On the other hand, we also know and, and history teaches us that heading into any election, this is often the period of time that sets things not necessarily in stone, mm -hmm. but on a pretty firm trajectory that is very difficult Orient. If you remember back to when uh, Barack Obama was running against Mitt Romney, they defined right. him in this spring and summer period and they just couldn't come back in the fall. And that's the big risk here for President Trump, that this time of year is going to cement uh, what he is able to do or not do in the fall. And I think, of course, the challenge for Joe Biden's campaign is avoiding complacency under these circumstances. And, and I do think that they are remembering back to what happened to Hillary yeah. Clinton. And I think uh, that uh, complacency is not as big of a right. risk for him because of what happened there. Hugh Hewitt, if there was a message of the week from the administration, it was that they wanted to show that there was a concerted effort here, that they were on the side of protecting statues. The administration, you had the, the Barr letter, you had Wolf's letter to t social media platforms, you had the president's letter to Chicago. Um, do you think an old style law and order type of messaging really is the right messaging right now? Well, I heard a different message, Chuck. I think there's a consensus that the statues of the Confederacy have got to come down. The bases that are named for treasonous people 
have to be renamed. I think the John Stennis carrier has to be renamed. He was a stone cold racist like Woodrow Wilson. I think there's a consensus on that. There's also a consensus that they have to be changed by lawful methods, not by mob violence. I thought Tom Cotton's speech on the floor of the Senate, uh, Senate talking about mob violence and Lincoln's speech at the Lyceum was very well received. I do believe what Casey just said, complacency on the Democratic side is their biggest danger. The Democrats have gone hard left, hard left. And the phantom of Joe Biden on the top of that is not going to cover over the AOC and the squad's effect on the party. Eddie Glaude, um, uh, your school at Princeton uh, is dropping Wilson's name. It's something I know you write about in your book. It looks like Mississippi is on its way to dropping the Confederate emblem that was in their state flag, being the final southern state to do this. What does this mean for us uh, in the story of America? Well, I think that we're in a moment of reckoning. I don't think uh, what Brother Hugh just laid out in terms of the fear of the radical left is what's going to drive us. It's really about our story. Who, who do we take ourselves to be? Look, Mississippi put the stars and bars in its, fa- on, in its flag in 18, 1894. And now the president of S- the SEC told them we, don't, we might not have championship events in your state if you continue to embrace uh, uh, the Confederacy. So they're, they're, there's big business that's bringing pressure to bear. And there's everyday ordinary people who are saying, what do, are you commending to us when you celebrate these sorts of folk who held the view that African Americans were inferior? So in some ways, Chuck, and I argue this in the book, we're at, a, we're at an inflection point. We're trying to imagine ourselves differently. That's not just going to yeah. take the, the form of symbols. It's going to take the form of policy. We need to put the two together, I think, in a very clear uh, and concise way. I'm curious, very quickly, what, what the Woodrow, Woodrow Wilson's place in history now, Eddie, what, what, should, it, um, what should it be? Well, it should be... Very quick, it should be just the facts. We should tell the truth about who he is and who he was, right? Tell the truth about his achievements and tell the truth about his faults and failures. That's what we need to do, and we need to give an interpretation of his presidency that actually reveals how flawed we are and how we're always on the road, not to necessarily to a more perfect union, but to a more just society. Right. So we need to commend the values that we uphold and cherish as we tell the story of the right. people who've made us who we are. All right. Well, before I say goodbye this morning, I want to take note that this is the 100th anniversary of the founding of the Negro Leagues this year. The world of baseball is launching a tip-your-hat campaign to bring recognition to those who played in the Negro Leagues when African Americans were banned from organized baseball. Presidents Clinton, Bush, and Obama have all taped tribute, which will be released tomorrow on their social media platform. So in honor of this anniversary, I am happy to tip my Homestead Grays hat, the team that played right in Washington, D.C., in honor of the Negro Leagues. Happy anniversary. That's all for today. Thank you for watching, and we'll be back next week, because if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. More Americans watch NBC News than any other news organization in the world. Hello from Washington, I'm Chuck Todd, and thanks for checking out the Meet the Press channel on YouTube. Click on the button down here to subscribe and click over here to watch the latest interviews, highlights, and other digital exclusives.